This Week in Startups is brought to you by Cisco Spark, Get Video Meetings, Team Messaging, Digital Whiteboarding, File Sharing, and Calling all in one secure app. Visit ciscospark.com to learn more and sign up for free. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. And today we're going to do another episode, which we try to do every month, of Ask Jason. This is where people who are starting companies or even angel investors ask me a question, and I try to give it my uh, best response, give it the most helpful response, tell you everything I know, just like I did in my book, Angel, the book, which you should buy on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Audible where I read it. Go ahead and buy the book. If you love the book, give it a five-star review. If you don't like the book, go ahead and email Brian Alvey, who is my co-host today. Brian Alvey and I went to high school together, built a couple companies together, and he helped me write this book, Angel. He was my writing coach. It's great to see how many people have read the book. Welcome back to the program, Brian Alvey. Thanks. I'm psyched to be here. Angelthebook.com. You've gotten a lot of uh, feedback on the book too, I guess. I have people uh, ask me things all the time or tell me yeah. things about it all the time. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's great to get um, feedback. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm super proud of it. I, yeah. you know, I expect good things from you. Yeah, but uh, there are people who are dissecting it and turning it into like a curriculum, like a bl- blueprint. They're actually yeah. following it, right? And it's working. It's kind of neat. Yeah. Well, when you think about it, if people didn't have a map of how to navigate the space before, even a rudimentary map has massive value. Right. Because there was no map before it, so we can give ourselves credit. But in truth, nobody really had an overarching thesis of early stage investing or had written a book on it. Mm-hmm. So it'd be very interesting. I hope two or three more people write books on it and you know have different right. uh, approaches. All right, I love doing this type of episode. I love having you here for it because you always have some good feedback and counterpoints to mine. Let's go right to the Cisco Spark board and play our first question. We, we ask people on the social networks. Uh, to send us questions, and Emmy Wardering producer Jackie got us, uh, you know, almost ten questions here. We're going to try to get through them as quick as possible, and we'll go to the Cisco Spark Board for our first question from Lee. Hi, Jason. Silly question, maybe, but why would someone take investment over bootstrapping within their company, other than to accelerate growth? Okay, so great question, and just to take a moment here to. Uh, define what bootstrapping is. In the book, we talk about bootstrapping. It is a term uh, that came from or originated from people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, which was uh, a metaphor, uh, colloquialism, whatever, because people would, on the back of boots, have a strap to pull them on. So when they say you pull yourself up by your bootstrap, it means you're, you're doing it out of your own effort. So bootstrapping means you use whatever method you had to get over the fence, to get over the hurdles, as opposed to using money to get over those hurdles. Now, taking investment means you dilute your cap table, your capitalization table, and you dilute in order to have money to accelerate growth. But if you, don't, if you have the ability to grow without money, then you don't have to give away shares and you still own 100% of your company. So bootstrapping is uh, the preferred method if you can. But as the person said, Lee, sometimes uh, you have a product that requires a lot of money to produce. So doing a hardware company would be the perfect example in my mind. Cafe X or Butterfly or Blockable, which is doing modular homes, you know, that's not just some software that you can write in a weekend with two people in a garage. Right. It requires a robotic arm that costs $25,000 or two coffee machines that cost $10,000 each. Like this takes a certain amount of money. So there is sometimes a requirement to have capital. And if you can, you bootstrap what you can to save money. What are your thoughts on this question? So along those lines, a pharmaceutical company has yeah. to spend a lot of money, millions of dollars, to do patents, to do research, to get things before they make their first dime of selling that drug uh, discovery, that drug. right? And then uh, even some software ones. So think of Snapchat or think of YouTube. Mm. Uh, YouTube had to foot the bill for the whole world putting all their videos on a, the YouTube platform for free before they had any way to make any money off of that and pay them back. And it so they were them out of business. eating money yeah. every month. I mean, that was literally the most expensive thing you could do on the internet. And their business model was, we're going to do that for free for the world. And do a lot of it. And I don't know, hope it, hope it works out. Yeah. Right? And so it did. But that, that's, you know, there's pros and cons to bootstrapping versus yeah. uh, taking on venture funding. And uh, a lot of it has to do with whether you can actually get customers before you run out of the money that you've saved up. 
So Yeah. Another reason is if money is freely available, focusing on revenue and getting traction in a consumer-based business is hard. These are two different disciplines. Getting users to use the product and getting people to buy advertising or whatever it is, these are two different things. So if you want to, you can raise money here in Silicon Valley if you have a track record or a great MVP. And let's say your Snapchat or your Facebook or your Twitter. You can say, you know what? We're going to focus just on delighting customers and getting as many as we can. And then when we're ready, then we're going to focus on the revenue side of the business, which means the founders or founder could spend 100% of their effort. It's a different kind of team. Just on engagement, which is exactly right. It is a different team. Mm -hmm. The product team versus the monetization team. Right. So great question, Lee. Uh, And bootstrap what you can. And don't be afraid to outsource as well. That's the other tip I always have is like, what do you need to do internally? If if your YouTube example is great because in another lifetime, YouTube would have had to rack servers and storage. They would have been a hardware company right. 15 years ago, 20 years ago. It would have been a hardware-driven business. They would have been racking hard drive after hard drive to have storage. But because of cloud computing, that was their why now. All right, let's take another question from the Cisco Spark Board. This one is from Ghana. Hi, Jason. Ghana here, co-founder and CEO of Round Team. I have a question for you. What, in your opinion, is the most successful revenue model for SaaS businesses targeting small and medium-sized companies' markets? Is it a freemium model, free trials, or maybe given a certain amount of product for free, like a Dropbox model? Thank you so much. Wow, this is a great, great question, Brian. You've got a lot of expertise in the uh, software space. Uh, So what we're talking about here is SaaS. To define that for people, when people say SaaS, they mean software as a service. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you pay for the software every month. And this is the opposite of packaged software, which was when you would buy Photoshop and you would have a copy of Photoshop that you would physically buy in a store or download. Or steal. Or steal or pirate. You'd pay for it one time. It was $1,000. And it was $1,000. Even the mighty Adobe now just charges 50 bucks a month for the Creative Suite, and it's software as a service. You pay as you go every month, which makes it a lower price point as you get in. And when she says SMB, SMB, that's another acronym meant to confuse people uh, who are not in the industry, and we'll always decode those for you here at This Week in Startups. That's a small to medium-sized business. And then when when she says freemium versus trials, freemium is when you sell the software and you give them a small amount of the software, for free, freemium. 30 days, 30 days free. 30 days free. So that's a time-based trial or use these 10 features but not these other 10 features mm-hmm. which we lock up. And a trial would be the amount of time you got to use it as opposed to just telling people they have to pay from day one. So now that we've defined everything, what is the most successful way to run a SaaS business targeted at SMBs in your mind, Brian Alley? So it depends on what you're selling. If you can get away with selling a 90-day trial that they have to pay for, mm-hmm. that then turns into you, you have to go out and sell them a renewal or it's an automatic renewal, yeah. go for that. You get money from day one. Right. If you don't have something that you can do that with, or if you don't have a sales team, then do freemium. It's 30 days free. And freemium, too, doesn't have to be 30 days for free. It can be, like you said, I get the subset of features. So I know you played around with uh, Social Rank. Mm. they have this amazing thing where super famous celebrities go in and say, I'm going to do this targeting DM stuff and see how my, see what makeup my Twitter followers have and all these things I can do. And you get to use it to a certain point. But then once you're sending out X number of messages, they say, oh, hey, hold on a second. Uh, yeah, we can't do that until you pay. So you get addicted to it. Mm. I mean, there are so many different ways to slice and dice that trial period, that, that freemium thing, that really there's no one size fits all. There's no best thing for anybody. And it really, I think, depends on what kind of sales team or what kind of sales organization you want to build out in the future. It's a great, great answer. I think if you look at a company like Slack or Yammer, mm. these were chat-based software, both of them were chat-based software, Yammer, then uh, HipChat, and then Slack where they let people use it for free in an organization. Addictive products. It's super addictive. And then what would happen is if you wanted the management control, Mm -hmm. in other words, to be able to say, take this person out, I want to see the archive of messages, searchable archives, for legal, for for compliance, and then also just to control it, put people in different groups, and what visibility or, Mm -hmm. as they call, roles each user can have. One role could be an administrator, one could be a manager, one could be a moderator, one could be a user. Read only, you name it, yep. 
If you want to have access to those type of tools, then you pay. And so what that did was it infected organizations. It took out all friction right. to use the product. So when you ask people for payment in advance, that's friction. It slows down the process. There might be a moment in time where you want friction. So I'll give you the counter to your point, mm -hmm. which is, yes, Yammer might want people to try it for free, but there might be software that's so complicated that when people want to use it, you say, I want you to request a trial. Right. Fill out this form, and somebody from our customer support team, our customer success team, as we call mm -hmm. it now, is going to call you, onboard you, teach you how to use the software, get your credit card, and then let you use it, or they're going to let you use it for five days for free, but they're going to check in with you after five days. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing there is you're putting up friction, but in exchange for the friction, you're going to get something great, which is if you put that friction there, you're going to get their contact information ahead it's of time. Super qualified. They're now way, you've way got qualified the leads. Right. They're way down the funnel. Mm -hmm. So one size does not fit all, and you can change course. Some right. people I see, they put it out for free, and then they go to... Uh, contact us for a trial. I've seen people start with contact us for a trial because we're in closed beta mm -hmm. and we really want to get to know the customers. And I love that one. So I have a company I've invested in called Superhuman, which mm -hmm. is like a better Gmail. Mm -hmm. And Raul, who is a genius, who's running Superhuman, um, he requires that you request a trial and then they actually, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of their secret sauce here for a minute, they allow uh, people to use it only after they've given them some training. What that does is, if they do that onboarding, their chances of success with the product go up, which then lowers their churn. No, of course, the, the, when you call them the success team, mm -hmm. right? The success team, I've had platforms, I've had friends who had platforms, and if you, if you give them a platform, here's a blank canvas, go, they're, they don't use it. A mm -hmm. year later, they've churned, they're not gonna renew, right? right? So holding their hand, walking them through, creating content, doing whatever that thing is. It's very funny, I'm on the uh, superhuman list, I think I'm like number 20,000 uh -huh. uh, for them to get to. It's kind of like, I may get warrior season tickets before I get superhuman email, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, well I, I have I know a, Rahul too. I can get you, I can get you ahead, I can get you ahead of the list. For the warriors or the uh, superhuman? I can't get myself ahead of the list for the warriors. And I, anyway, I don't want this a sore spot for me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks for that, all right. Hey, everybody. Let me take a minute to thank Cisco Spark for supporting This Week in Startups. You work with people in multiple locations. I bet you do if you're listening to This Week in Startups. And working together was never easier than with the Cisco Spark system. The Cisco Spark board is amazing. And you can do great video meetings, team messaging, digital whiteboarding, file sharing, and calling all in one secure app. You don't need to have the Cisco Spark board. That's amazing to have like we have in our offices, but you can just use Cisco Spark and it works on all your devices and it's completely free. Other products cost a lot of money, as you know. Proceed, Cisco Spark works on all your devices and it's free. It's the fastest way to host and join meetings and it works with industry leading video systems like the Cisco Spark board. The Cisco Spark board is of course touch based. It's an all in one device. You just plug it in and you're ready to go. It's designed for large rooms and for small ones. You can do video calling, digital whiteboarding, a wireless presentation on the 55 or the whopping 70 inch screen. We use the Cisco Spark board here to do whiteboarding and to do meetings. And once you put a bunch of files into a chat room, you can pull them right up on the Cisco Spark board. It's so easy to use. Go visit ciscosparkboard.com and you can learn more and sign up for free. So if you're a fan of the show, and you're working in business there, you want to get some meetings going, go to ciscospark.com to learn more and sign up free. It's an amazing product, well worth a visit, ciscospark.com to learn more. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Let's take another question from the Cisco Spark board. Hi, Jason. I run a recruitment startup that develops IT talent for corporations through a summer internship program. We only make money when we run the program and we want to provide value to our corporate sponsors and our students throughout the year. What's your advice on how we develop recurring revenue around talent recruitment? Okay, Aku, thank you for that great question. To summarize, he runs a recruiting startup that is seasonal. When you say a business is seasonal, it makes money during a season. In his case, during the internship, which I assume is in the summer. 
just like there might be a small town like Amityville where they make money in the summer and then the sharks kill everybody and then they're, you know, the other eight Banana months a year. Stand. There's all there's all these seasonal businesses. Yeah. And so how would you hack the, the uh, seasonal business? Well, we just talked about software as a service and a monthly fee. What I would ask myself, what do those recruiters and do those interns need post their internship? Well, they need career development, right? And they probably need some training. So what I would do is I would create a yearly subscription where not only do you do the internships, but you help the companies develop the talent over the year with skills training from September to onward. Mm -hmm. So if you were, if these were developers, let's say, or sales executives, you could say, we're going to do a summer internship where we train them on the basics. But then once they get in your organization, we're going to do continuing education where we train them on best practices and we check in with them about their happiness in the company and if it's a fit. So you could do continuing training comes to mind. What are your thoughts? I would also look at why they're seasonal. Why summer? Why is that the only time people either have the time to teach or the time to learn? Mm. And isn't there a pack of people that, you know, that take summer classes and get their degree at the end of the summer and then are looking for something when September hits, right? Yeah. So what are those other seasons? Can they layer on two more seasons right. uh, in the year or six more seasons and figure out how to make that a year-round thing? Don't call it summer camp for coding. Call yeah. it, you know, two-month boot camp for coding yeah. and run it six times a year. That's what I would do. Yeah, I would question your core thesis, which right. might be doing a winter session, mm -hmm. might be doing the spring session, not just the summer. So, so it could be that they have some kind of a deal. In the mm -hmm. summer, the place that's, you know, let's say it's a school, they're usually using the facilities and in the summer they're not. So yeah. they have two months of free office training space, that sort right. of thing. Um, but there are businesses like that that just take whatever, there's, there's free space all the time. So if that's the gating yep. factor, uh, think of all the pop-up Halloween stores. Every year, there's one that we take our kids to. It's somewhere near where it was last year, but it's not in the same, it's in whatever place, doesn't have a tenant. They right. just take whatever you've got. They're going to take. They're going to pay you next to nothing for your office space for two months and sell Halloween costumes. So I think there's probably an angle in there for them to find the space, to find the teachers, and to find the students who aren't busy. All right, great question, and we hope that helps. Let's take another question. This one from Rafi on the Cisco Spark board. My name is Rafael Lori, and I'm currently working on a large-scale business project that involves the fields of entertainment, hospitality, and innovative technology. I'm currently on the initial phase of my project, and I had a couple of questions for you. When trying to attract my first initial investor, what, what should I be bringing him? What do I need to do in order to catch him? Do I need to bring renderings? Do I need numbers, concepts, story? What, what's the best thing to bring him in order to bring him on board? And secondly, one of the most important parts about any business is its team. And I want to know where's the best place to start looking for a team, to start growing my team, and what are the key components of what I should be looking for in that team? Okay. Great question. Brian, you want to take that first? Wow. You only asked me to take it first because it's like a whole book's worth of answers, right? Yeah. How do I build a team? How do I find an investor? Pick Where one. do I start? Yeah. Wow. Um, it, it's funny. Uh, you have to start with your story, what your, what your sort of value is, right? Come up with something interesting. And if it's interesting enough to get an investor, it's interesting enough to get a co-founder, to get a CTO, to get a director of sales, right? Got it. So, so there's, at some point, there's a story where this person is tar turning to somebody and saying, hey, this is what I'm doing. Come join me, hmm. right? Whether it's an investor or talents. You can almost treat them the same or way. Or a customer. Exactly, or a customer. Those are, those are my three favorite ones. Um, so it, it's, you know, it sounds like it's very early days, like napkin yeah. sketch days for this sort of thing. I would find the talent first, yeah. convince them to help me build it. Because, because I will tell you the initial question of what I need to show to an investor um, is very easy. You need to sit, show them something that is so compelling they want to write a check today. Right. Not just start a relationship and have coffee with you every six months. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a very easy thing for investors to do. But what are you going to do that will make them invest? You don't want an investor as a friend. You want an investor as an investor. So what can you do that is so compelling? And what you can do is show them a magic trick. I've invented this. These people are dazzled by it. These people have joined me on my mission. Give me your check. Right. That's how you roll in. You don't roll in with, give me money and then I will go build it. I've heard you tell this to yeah. dozens or hundreds of people. Right. I don't want to write you a check so you can go find out. what to, like. Do that thing first. Come back to me when right. you know what you're going to do. Then I'll write you a check. Yeah. There are different types of investors in the world. We're talking about early stage technology startup venture mm -hmm. investors here. So to be clear, one of the reasons there's some confusion about this exact point, I think, Brian, is 
people will see an angel investor who puts $50,000 into a pizzeria or $250,000 into a movie or a dry cleaner mm -hmm. and think, oh, that's an investor. And I came to them with an idea and they did it. Well, your idea was to, to put a pizzeria in. We've all been to pizzerias our whole life. There's not something that has to be taken apart or we have to wonder about. The economics is going to be pretty straightforward. You may pay back the $250,000 loan for your pizzeria in two or three years, and that person might make some profit on top of that that beats the stock market maybe mm -hmm. um, and if it's a movie it's just a gift so if we're talking about in the high-tech sector depending on who you are the team the traction will be variable so a well-known founder can raise money on just an idea Mm -hmm. Because investors will say, that person has done two successful ideas. Evan Williams did Blogger. They did Twitter. Whatever Evan Williams is doing next, if it's Medium, I'm in. Mm -hmm. I don't need to know what Medium is. We'll have a conversation. I'll talk to him. He'll give me the pitch. And we'll get going. But you're not going to never see your money again. Yeah, you, you feel relatively uh, secure in the person's track record. Mm -hmm. Now... And this would happen in the movie business, too. Do I need to have George Clooney read for the part? No. Right. I don't need to have an Oscar winner read for the part. They're an Oscar. Sir Alec Guinness, good enough. He doesn't have to read for Obi-Wan. He's, he's a sir. Right. Come on. Just let him take the part. You're lucky enough to have him. Now, if you're a nobody with no track record, be self-aware and say, I don't have any track record. Therefore, I have to manifest something in the world to trigger the investment. Well, what are you going to manifest in the world? A great product. That's a magic trick, as you call it. I love that metaphor. Where you take out your app and you're like, here's Clipisode. That's your product, uh, which you can download on the App Store now. And you say, look, here's what I'm doing. It builds shows on the go. And you, and you show them the output or you show them the tool. And they go, wow, that's so clever. I got to be involved. The magic trick for Cafe X was watch the machine make 12 cups of coffee in three minutes. It's dazzling. It's dazzling. Okay, great. I'll put money into that. That sounds incredible. Or the story. Listen, uh, Blockable is going to make homes uh, for the same price per square foot, but they're going to make them in 75% less time. Mm -hmm. Great. That makes a lot of sense to me. Saving the time, but at the same price, equals a win. Oh, and the track record is you worked at Amazon for Jeff Bezos? Great. Now we're starting to you know, have a picture of something we can pull a trigger on. The problem I think some people have is they watch from the outside, rounds of funding happen. They look at the edge cases, and they decide, why is this edge case not me? Why was Color, this doomed app from back in the day, able to raise so much money? Well, the founder had sold a company to Apple. Mm -hmm. So people just threw money at him because he's uh, talented. It didn't work out. That's fine. But people look at the edge case and say, why can't I raise $30 million out of the well, gate? They look at edge cases where it seems like somebody just kind of lucked into it. Overnight yeah. success. There's a napkin sketch in a, in a, in a Starbucks. And then, yeah. boom, they got the thing. So I think you have to look at uh, some other cases. Look at um, the first investment that uh, Snapchat got. Yeah. It was four hundred grand. It was from Lightspeed. And it didn't come about because they went and pitched them. It came about because somebody at Lightspeed said to their kids, what are the three hottest things that you guys can't live without right now? And they said, this, this, and Snapchat. He's like, well, show me all of them. Hmm. He looked at Snapchat. And then he, know that story. he sought the founder out. Jeremy Liu sought the founder out to give him a check. He said, I went in. I don't know if you're taking VC right now. But knowing that, now look at the thing you've built or haven't built, right? Which is a little bit worse, right? But the thing that you're going to build and think, how do I become that thing that everybody's kids are like completely addicted to where a VC is going to seek me out? I don't have to do any pitches at all. I just right. cash the check. Like, be that. Be right. desirable. Be fundable. Got it. Uh, great question, Rafi. And let's take another question from the Cisco Spark Board. Hi, Jason. My name is Juan. Our company, Kimsa. We want to bring health into our food with our tasty plant-based protein snacks. Our addressable market is the U.S. health and wellness snack bar market with $5.7 billion in value. It has grown 2x since 2013. Our product is the Kimsa Quinoa Bar. Why quinoa? Because quinoa protein is as good as meat and egg protein. It is a high quality protein. We humans need high quality protein in order to bring into our bloodstream all the nutrients we need. We will position our product as a premium bar, reaching 70% gross margins when we achieve full production. We will sell our products online and through natural retail stores. 
what we are looking for is support to become the leader in the global health snacks space. But the most important message here is, Kim, is that Kimsa is a very good opportunity for investors and for you, Jason, because of what is going on in the global food industry right now, we can say that healthy food is eating unhealthy food. Thank you, Jason, and I hope to have the chance to talk to you. Bye. Okay, Juan, well done. I, uh, I got the pitch, and it's for quinoa bars. Mm -hmm. I hate quinoa. Quinoa's yeah. terrible. I'm My not wife a fan. loves it. Nikki loves quinoa. She's totally Totally. I don't like grains. I'm not a grain right. guy. Right. And quinoa is like probably the grain I, I like least mm -hmm. of all grains. On the plus side, I've been pitched things, uh, other products that are based on some powder or something right. I've never, never heard of. Right. At least quinoa has like a great they're, they're Quinoa's having, got great brand. People love great quinoa yes. for some reason. Like agave. Right. It's got a good sure. PR firm. Right. Yes, it does. <laughs> agave is like got, terrible right. for you. Got quinoa. Right. Yeah. Like quinoa, agave, mm -hmm. stevia, mm -hmm. and granola. All, everybody thinks these are all healthy. I think only one of them is. Maybe two of them are. Sure. But anyway, putting it aside, um, food products are not venture investments uh, in our world here in Silicon Valley, technology-based mm -hmm. companies in general. There are some minor places where you'll see um, the drink Soylent, which seems to be doing pretty well. Um, and you, once in a while, you'll see Itza, which is doing a quinoa-based bowl business. I'm not sure how that's doing. My friend started it. And uh, there are variations, like subscription business. Like VCs understand subscription businesses. I have subscription food product business, right? Sure. But it's not about the food. And the reason is the food business has terrible margins, and it scales very slow with a physical product. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. <laughs> but if you do do it, you should not expect to get high-tech software and technology companies to do it. Now, I don't want to dissuade people from operating in the real world because real food and the global food shortage, potentially, mm -hmm. could be a problem eventually. But one of the things you also have to realize is um, it's just going to be a, a ridiculously hard business. You will need to find investors who are passionate about a 5x return or a 10x return, not expecting a 50 or 100x return. Quinoa bars will probably never get there. I'm sure there's been a 100x food investment like McDonald's or something. It does happen. It probably doesn't happen often. So I would not be interested myself unless there was some sort of technology angle that made this new. And I don't think quinoa in and of itself would. Right. And I don't care how good it tastes. It might be something that on Shark Tank, you know, the sharks, it might make for good television. The sharks eat it and or like it. They have an angle where they can put this in stores. I don't have an angle where I can help people get into QVC or Target. Correct. Now, I am an investor in a gummy vitamin company, mm -hmm. right? It's called Smarty Pants. It's doing incredibly well, but it's been a long, slow road. And it was my friend's company, Gordon Gould, who I invested in out of support of a friend. I didn't right. really invest with the same concept of I would have a return that I would have on Thumbtack or Uber or Datastax or Wealthfront or Robinhood or Desktop Metal. I wasn't looking for unicorn-like economics. Right. But it's done actually very well, and I'll probably have a very good return on it. All that being said... Know your audience and know that this is going to be a hard road for you. Mm -hmm. If you can, going back to our first question, if you can bootstrap this in some way, that might be wise. In other words, if you can get a local cafe to buy, buy the batch, 500 bars, mm -hmm. because they're, I don't know, uh, a store that is for runners and runners love this or it's snowboarders and snowboarders right. love it. And you can get them to pay you in advance $2 a bar and they sell it for four and they buy 500 at a time, you can make them and grow on demand and then eventually get somebody to provide a loan or a credit facility for you, then you might not need to raise money. In other words, you just eat what you kill in this case. So there's, there's an angle here where there's somebody I talked to recently, mm. he has a business of selling, it's like socks and underwear, but they're all yeah. like cool designs and stuff like that. Okay. It's a really interesting thing and he's crushing it. Right. Millions and millions of dollars in revenue. They're in all these stores. He listed all these like big chain stores. Yeah. So the only way I would think that this business was interesting with the quinoa bars is if they had a, a distribution channel where they had like a guarantee, we're going to be in Target, we're going to be in Whole Foods, we're going to be yep. this, we're going to be that. And if they have that, why are they talking to us? You know? So the yeah. only way it succeeds is if you have a plan, if you have a connection, if you have a way to sell something that really anybody can maybe make. Mm. I don't know that this is, you know, colored socks, right? I can make colored socks, but yeah. this guy can get them into stores. 
he wins, right? The distribution is exactly what Smarty Pants had to figure out. They okay. made the vitamins, the gummy vitamins. They taste delicious. You can go buy them for your kids, and they're like literally little gumdrops. Mm -hmm. I followed them from the beginning. And my, so my daughter loves these. I give mm -hmm. them to her as a reward. So literally vitamins went from being something that you had to fight with your kids to eat to becoming a reward for what I do is I take two or three of them, and I put them in the cup holder in the car, and I say, when your seatbelt's on, then you can eat them. Mm -hmm. So on the way to school... I have all these little parenting hacks. That's nice. my parenting hack, which is like she forgets to put her seatbelt on or she like wants me to put the seatbelt on and, you know, we're late for school and we got to get moving here. Come on, I'm mm -hmm. putting my seatbelt on. You put your seatbelt on. I want her to be independent. So I say, when you eat, when the seatbelt's on, you can eat the gummy vitamins and she's such a good kid. She'll eat the vitamins after she puts the seatbelt on. You can use these hacks at work too, by the way. You can? Yeah, you can. Okay, good. Yeah. When the episode goes up, <laughs> Jackie, when the episode's up and we hit 100,000 downloads, then you can have some- Four. You can get a burger from Marlo around the yes. corner. I'll get uh, you a burger. Uh, all right, listen, Juan, uh, great pitch. I actually think it was a pretty good pitch, all well, things fine. considered. Yeah, yeah. Nice job, Juan. Uh, and I wish you luck with it, but understand that it's not a technology business, and you are going to need to figure out distribution. Okay, let's go to our next question from the Cisco Smart Board. This one comes from Karen. Hi, my name is Karen McCord. I'm CEO of Breezio. We're located in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. My question for you, Jason, has to do with, it seems to me that entrepreneurs need to be dogged and single-minded about their product or idea, and yet agile enough to change course if things aren't going well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about how entrepreneurs should balance the two. Thank you very much. Wow, this is such a great perennial question. We get it every couple of years here at This Week in Startups, and I get it you know, every month with my portfolio, which is, should we pack it in? Or should we persevere? Mm -hmm. Should we give up and move on, shut the company down, lick our wounds, and then come back stronger with the next company? Or should we be dogged and persevere? Uh, and agility is a nice way of saying pivoting. It could be a nice way of sh saying shut down the company and move on to the next idea. And there is no exact answer to this. It's very circumstantial. I think one of the reasons to be dogged is because none of these businesses explode overnight. It looks like Uber or Airbnb exploded overnight. The truth, however, is Airbnb, Uber, Twitter, these things took a long time to manifest themselves. Even the mighty Facebook, which has grown super fast, it took them a long time to hit scale. So I think if you have customers who love the product and who are embracing it, even if it's a small number of them, being dogged is a wise idea. If nobody loves your product and you don't have super fans, this is a pretty good sign that you might want to pack it in or reconstitute your product. If nobody loves your product, you don't have that small set of 50 or 100 or the 1,000 true fans, as um, Kevin Kelly calls it, and you like to phrase, Brian, uh, or like to repeat you know, all the time, like you need those 1,000 true fans. If you have those 1,000 true fans or 100 or even 10, at least you have them. Mm -hmm. At least you have those people who will be devastated when your product goes away. But if nobody's devastated that your product goes away, then maybe it is time to pack it in and find an idea that's so essential that you people have to have it. What are your thoughts on persevering, uh, doggedness versus agility? Yeah, you know, like you mentioned, all those success overnight success stories yeah. had probably two, three, five years mm -hmm. of a dozen opportunities to stop, pack it in, change what they were doing, not hold on doggedly to that original vision. Um, but they did, and they made it, and they were right to do that. It's very hard to tell. It's definitely hard to tell if nobody cares, then that, that's a good sign to kind of leave. I, there's a phrase, I think it's a title of a book, which is um, often, often wrong but never in doubt, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, I am, I am completely convinced of what I'm doing until I'm finally convinced not to do it, and then I let it go, and I get on to the next one. But you have to hold on to it for a long time. Uh, and the other thing is, every startup looks delusional at the beginning, whether it's going to be the next Amazon, or the next you know, Pets.com, you know, whatever else you can mention, that's a, that's a big failure, right? Color you mentioned before. Um, so it, it's, it's a balancing act. It's a really tough thing to do, but you know, I think everybody that makes it, I'm, I, I've pivoted plenty. So it's, it's, uh, you have to listen to your customers. It's probably the best answer. Listening to your customers, you can never go wrong because they'll be your North Star. If they're not using the product, this is one of the fool's gold thing that can happen is a charismatic founder can get people to pay for a product or download it but not use it. Mm -hmm. So I could 
through sheer force of will, say, I got this new app, please download it. Right. People know who I am. I got some Twitter followers. I might get 1,000 or 10,000 people to try it. But what really matters is that they get use from it. It's a good time to segue into a plug for the book Angel. If people, if I write a book, yes, people will buy it. There's some number of fans of the podcast or my conferences or things I've done. But what I was really judging myself on was the reviews and the use of the book. Would people actually take the advice and put it to use as actual investors? And I'm delighted to see 265 star reviews on Amazon, as an example, or 400 reviews on Audible. It's interesting that Audible is actually outpacing it. I think Audible has this, speaking of product, they have this great device. When you finish a book, it prompts you to rate it. If a person finishes a book, I think there's a higher likelihood for them to write a review. And because they're vested in it, because they finished it, and they've committed those hours, it's more likely that they will write a higher review. Right. Because they will have a vested interest in, oh, they don't want to have, they don't want to say at the end, I wasted five hours, I'm going to give a one star. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I just actually think that, like, there's something unique about audible in that way that mm-hmm. they they force you or they don't force you they just give you a, a a screen that makes you skip it if you don't want to rate it but at the end it asks you to rate the book so this is one of the things engagement in a product is the truth not the downloads not the purchases right the engagement if people buy netflix because they think it's a great deal at eight dollars a month but they never watch shows on netflix that's bad for netflix the netflix right. because those people will then become detractors of the product so speaking of angel investors and an angel investing book, you're one of my angel investors and I yeah. don't want to play favorites, but another one of my angel investors who I love, yeah. uh, Mike Jones, he had a quote and he, he told me, here's how you're going to know if your product is working, if you stick with it, which is if there's a small group, could be 20 people, could be three people yeah. who every day when they wake up, they open your thing first and every night before they go to bed, they check how they're doing in your thing, yeah. right? If you can get those people where it's the first thing they do in the morning, the last thing they do at night, if you can get the ones who are actually engaged in your book, right? Those kinds of things. Not just the one who buy it, download it, mm. but actually use it right? and get addicted to it and really care about it and right. build their lives around it, then you're onto something. If not, do something else. Yeah. Okay. Let's take another question from the Cisco Spark board. This one comes from Patrick. Patrick, what's your question? Hello, Jason. My name is Patrick Scully, and my product is PixelFlow, a secure video sharing platform for business. Can you tell me what types of metrics and amount of traction an enterprise product should have before presenting to angel investors? Also, is there anything unique to enterprise SaaS in the way of the type of investor, the ask, or market conditions to bear in mind? Thank you. Great question. Again, we're back to when should I approach an angel investor? He didn't say venture capitalist. He Mm -hmm. said angel investor. So with angel specifically, we're talking about uh, pre-traction or modest traction would be the time. So there are two specific moments that I suggest. One is pre-launch where you can sell the promise. You've got a product that's really beautiful. It's a great demo. It's got the wow factor. You could show that wow factor to an angel, and they'd say, wow, this is a really fine-looking product. I can get in at a 3 or $4 million valuation before it launches. Great. I want to put 40 k in and own 1% of the company now. I'll take that risk. The second moment in that early stage is, oh, we have 10 customers paying, or we have 100 people using it every day, and they love it, so that the investor can say, oh, modest traction. Who are these 10 customers? Oh, three of them are your friends. Two of them are people you worked with before, but these five you got, you earned from some other location. They weren't previous relationships. Where did you get them? Oh, you got them from Facebook? Oh, you got them from a story in the Wall Street Journal or from being on Product Hunt? Somehow you earned those five customers. Now that gives you some group of customers to be reference customers that you can talk to. And you can go to them, talk to them, and hopefully, after you talk to them, as an investor, you can feel more certain and when you have 10 customers, if you're making 10K a month, $1,000 each or 50K, perfect time to start talking to angel investors. If you have five to $50,000 a month in revenue, half million dollars a year, maybe you're burning 50K a month, you're spending 100K a month, so you're spending 1.2 million a year, you're making 600,000, 
great time to talk to an angel. The business is up and running. They have customers. You've got a team. Fantastic. You've got modest traction or medium traction. That's an easier window to raise money. The earlier you go, the harder it is. You have more questions to answer. Brian, what are your thoughts? So it's, it's an interesting thing. You are... If you look at a business like Twitter, Facebook, right. uh, Google, uh, any of the Amazon, in year five or year 10, it's very clear what they do. Their yeah. picture is very detailed, very filled in. But if you think about it, like a comic book page, right? Those are very, very clear. But in day one, there was just a sketch. We think yeah. it's going to look like this. It hasn't been inked yet. It hasn't been colored. There's right. no letters on the page. It's just a sketch. So there's a whole spectrum. And in the angel investing stage, you're actually looking for somebody who's willing to use their own imagination to fill in the rest of that sketch. You're yeah. coming to them with something that's super incomplete, super amorphous. It's two years in, when you get your A round, another year in, you get your B round. Once you get to a D, E, F round, all these things, everybody knows what Twitter is, what it does, everything. Yeah, there's there's no, no mystery equation. to it, yeah. right? So you're looking for people who are willing to help you plan that out, who are going to fill in the gap. So like you said, I don't have any customers yet. I haven't launched yet. Take a look at this. What do you think? The kind of person you want, the angel investor you want, is the one who understands, wait, without you telling them, you're going to get these kinds of customers. Here's probably what you're going to charge them. Here's the team you're going to build. They're willing to do that work. An A round, B round investor is not willing to do that work. They right. want to see something that's more defined, that's more right. concrete. So it's really about finding those people who maybe been in that space before, hmm. who can visualize the success, who see the opportunity and the positivity, yeah. not all the reasons to say no. Yeah, and it, this is specifically an enterprise company. So there are enterprise investors like Jason Lemkin, people who specialize in this, and who sold can businesses to these companies. They and know, they've they sold businesses, the so they ends. can fill in the blanks. Correct. You tell them, hey, I'm doing a science fiction film, and it has an alien race, and there's a hero, and they go, wait, I got it. Right, I'm in. I'm in. Yep. So I can help. You're in. Right. It's like, yeah, I produced Star Wars, and I produced Blade Runner. Right. And I produced Fifth Element. Like, I was a writer on all these different sci-fi shows. I was a writer on Battlestar Galactic. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I understand. Yeah, it's sci-fi. It takes place in outer space. You have a warp drive. Great, let's keep going. Right. Boom. Mm -hmm. They start filling in your answers for you. Right. And that's a great place to be. And you can research that pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Look at your business and say, what, how was this business accomplished last year or five years ago or 10 years ago? Oh, okay. People used to use... Uh, before Uber, people used to use this other taxi magic service or mm -hmm. they would use this other software to book cars, whatever it is. How, or they would use uh, Hertz Rent-A-Car. Mm -hmm. They could start looking at the day. If you were an investor in Hertz Rent-A-Car or Avis, you would be like, oh, Uber, I get it. People at an airport can rent. Oh, I totally get this. This is great. Boom. A lot of them have unfinished business. I think you've talked about that before. So yes. somebody who failed at a product that required you to buy a lot of storage and keep it in your office and keep mm. the data backups and two power supplies mm. and all that stuff. Nowadays, when you go, oh, you just use S3 at Amazon? Just, I totally get this. Let's attack this again. I've, I've fought this battle before and we lost. I have unfinished business. I want to charge that hill again, and I think you're the person for me to do it with. Right. That's a great one. If That's somebody has angel. scar tissue and they're like, you know right. what? We did a game company, and we did it on Facebook, and it was social games, and it didn't work. But mm -hmm. what you're doing is social gaming plus mobile on a mobile phone, which everybody has in their pocket all day. My God, Farmville didn't get escape velocity on Facebook. It kind of mm -hmm. you know, went up and then went back down. But Facebook, as Clash of Clans on your mobile phone? Mm -hmm. Oh, you've got your phone with you all the time. You can harvest all the time. You can have all these game mechanics pinging you on your iPhone. Great. Let's go. Let's right. try to do it again. Great question, Patrick. Let's take another question from the Cisco Spark Board. This question is from Patty L. Hey, Jason. It's Patty with Acknowledgements. Everybody is talking about diversity today. So my question for you is how do founders create great teams with diversity and amazing talent? I work with students, parents, and educators, and so diversity is very important to me. Hey, thanks, Jason. Have a remarkable week. Oh, thank you, Patty. That was very nice of you. I hope I do have a remarkable week. I'll, I'll let you know how poker goes tonight. I'm hoping the remarkable starts with my poker game tonight. I'm, I'm stuck for the year. It's the first time I've been stuck for a year in three years. I can't take it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it, I got two months left. Maybe I can get even by the end of the year. Um, so diversity is on everybody's mind. And I think creating a diversity in a startup, in the first four or five hires, I understand that it's critical to have some diversity early on. Now, the challenge here is most people are saying, hey, when you start a company, I'm looking for teams 
who have worked together before. So I just had Pejman on, who is a great angel investor, and he's like, I always look for a team, a team that has history together. Mm -hmm. Now, there is your conundrum. Uh, when you start a company or a project, you're going to look to the people you've worked with before. If that group is not massively diverse, in other words, you're coming out of college and with your sorority sisters, you start a company because you've spent four years bonding in university as sorority sisters, or you worked at Google on a team and it happened to be a bunch of dudes who went to MIT and then worked for Google on their robotics. And it's three dudes from three white dudes or three Indian dudes or Asian dudes, whatever it happens to be. Now you don't have diversity from day one. And from what I understand about the diversity research, starting the diversity push early means it is easier to do than doing it retroactively because the criticism of culture, we all know, we hear the word culture thrown around, culture is super important. Well, if you have culture early on, the culture might be the sorority sisters or the MIT geeks who worked on the, the robotics club. So now you've got this culture which may be actually repelling certain other groups and demographics, genders, et cetera. So I think it's important to think about this early on. One good thing that's happening, I think, is millennials are coming to the table with a much more diverse group of people. Therefore, you may not have this uh, origination inception problem that I've seen with older companies, with older founders. Putting all that aside, diversity takes work. It takes being aware. Uh, I won't use the word woke uh, because that's becoming a little bit of a trigger word, but uh, like they're parodying it on SNL. Like, but being aware that diversity is important, believing that it's important to have different perspectives around the table, uh, I think is the starting point. And I think a lot of people now realize sometimes people start a company and they don't have a female on the team or they don't have a male on the team, whatever the case may be. They may be missing a key uh, perspective. They may not have somebody who's African-American or Hispanic. And then we have a large population here in California that is Hispanic. You may just lose that entire market. Right? If you don't have somebody who's from that market and who lives in that market or grew up in it. So it's clear that diversity equals strength and opens up your aperture to have more opportunity. Therefore, focusing on it early, which means placing more ad want ads in more places and demanding to see more candidates is the key. If you don't put effort into it, and you just go to your existing pool of the people who are in the MIT club or your sorority sisters and you ask them, you're just not going to have it. And so here at launch, we look for a more diverse group of people. We're constantly looking to, and you know, when in a small company, you may succeed, you may not, but you have to do the work. If you don't do the work and you, you're not aware of it, it's not going to happen organically. In fact, the opposite seems to happen organically. So I think the number one recognition is this is important. If you do believe it's important, then you have to make an effort to have a wider pool of candidates and say, we're not going to stop looking for candidates until we see a diverse pool of candidates. What are your thoughts, Brian? So I agree with you. I've also seen you answer this question really well on uh, other shows. Um, the, you know, starting with like equals, you know, like attracts like, mm -hmm. right? That's going to happen where you came from, the school you went to, the town you went to, the people you grew up with, your friends. You and I went to high school together. Wait, who else am I going to start a company with? But somebody I trust, whose strengths I know, whose who weaknesses I know. Who we took the same train station into exactly. Manhattan. I mean, the reason you and I became collaborators in a lot of ways was because we were both on the R train. Yep. Going and we'd from see each other coming, we'd coming see home it. from work. How was your day today? It sucked. I want to start a company. How was your day today? It sucked. We should start a company together, right? That was basically what we did. And we exactly. did. We went and started a magazine. So, so and it I was think, a boys' Catholic high school. So, talk about the aperture being closed. It was only right. one gender, right. and it was only generally. I think when we went to Severian, it was Irish, Greek, Swedish. Yeah, it's mostly Catholic kids. Catholic, Catholic high white school. kids in Bay Ridge. A couple of <laughs> non-Catholics thrown in, but all boys. Now yeah. they're finally two years into being a co-ed. Anyway, enough about all boys Catholic high school. Yeah. The uh, so trigger like, warning. No, no, like attracts like, and so it's it's something you have to actively overcome. You have to actually work at it, and it's tough to do it for the sake of doing it. But I think there are ways around it, which is uh, getting not just let's say I have to hire three developers. I have no money. Who am I going to convince? The three guys that used to work with me. Okay, now it's four white guys in a company. But can you get mentors? 
Can you get investors? Ah. Can you get other people who give you a different perspective? Can you have board members who are diverse? There are places where you can absolutely, you don't have to get those same people to be on your board. You can get a very diverse board. You can get a very diverse group of uh, investors. You can get a very diverse group of customers. The other thing that I would say is everybody focuses on, we have an all-white team, nobody's black, nobody's Asian, nobody's Hispanic. Or we have an all-male team, no females. But I've had some pretty good luck with having geographically diverse teams. Mm. So the only, the only other person in my company right now lives in Kansas. Politically diverse teams. So people ah. who don't all vote the same. Because you can get a whole bunch of people in San Francisco that look diverse, and they're missing but what, they ha- what the half way. the country is doing. Yeah. Right? That's also a disaster for a product that you want to have uh, consumer adoption. So I think there are many ways to be diverse, but it completely takes work, like you said. I know we've had this with Inside.com. We, we send out the Inside Daily Brief. And listen, it's a primarily California-based company mm-hmm. with New York people. So it's a coastal company, like a lot of media companies. And people are like... And I can just tell they're from the Rust Belt. They're from Middle America. They're like, you're just dogging Trump all the time. Trump's getting dogged. And I'm like, really? I don't, I don't see that. But okay, I get it. You're reading Breitbart every day or you're watching Fox News every day. And if we're linking to the New York Times, you're asking us why we don't link to Fox News. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons we don't re- link to Fox News that often is they're, they're a TV show, not journalists and reporters. They're commentators. But in a lot of places... You know, in the world, uh, here in the United States, rather, people are watching Fox, which doesn't hire technically investigative journalists like line journalists who are out there doing firsthand reporting. They're commenting on other people's reporting. So that's not actually apples to apples. But still, we have to live with that reality. And God bless Lon Harris, who works for me, and he is a liberal living in Los Angeles, and he will write a very compelling, and he's very vigilant about We understand your position. Here is why we wrote this story this way based on the evidence. And a lot of times he's responding to people who are saying, you got to lock up Hillary. She's crooked Hillary. Like they're literally parroting what Trump says. And some of it is nonsensical. And it's not based on any reporting. In some cases, we have people responding with stuff that Snopes has already said is not true. And we have to point them to a Snopes article. Or, you know, three other sources say, listen, this has actually been found to not be true, but we do it in a very nice, calm way. But even still, you're 100% right. There's a blind spot politically here in Silicon Valley where mm-hmm. people are not, and I think that's why it was so shocking to New Yorkers and people in Los Angeles and San Francisco that Trump won. Of course, we're sitting here on day one of the impeachment. Like, literally, it's the day the Mueller indictment uh, came down for... Um, uh, Manafort and all these people, but uh, I kid, uh, or maybe I don't. Who knows? Maybe maybe this episode will be looked at ten years from now, and it will literally be day one of an impeachment process. But it is important, I think, to have that diversity as well in mindset, in mindset. And you know, I, I, if you look at the investment community, which I am now part of, I, although I'm not diverse in terms of the color of my skin and my gender. I'm pretty diverse in the fact that I'm a kid from Brooklyn who went to school at night at Fordham and didn't go to an Ivy League school, didn't go to Stanford, didn't have a finance degree, don't have an MBA. When I came into the investment game, almost everybody was an MBA from Stanford, Harvard, Wharton, wherever. So I am diverse in terms of not just socioeconomic background to be in the venture space. Now, that's not enough diversity because it still looks like a bunch of white uh, dudes, but it's getting more diverse as we go. But I love your comment, Brian, of having the different stakeholders be diverse too. Stakeholders right. could be customers, board of advisors, board of directors. So you can also look for diversity there. Mm-hmm. And I think you're seeing that in the boards of companies now, where if a company doesn't have a female on the board of directors in 2017, it is a cause for a news story. And it will be uh, hounded that company will be hounded, rightfully so, for a very long time if it's 12 dudes in a boardroom. And they'll say, where is the female board member? At a very least, where is the African-American board member? Where is the Hispanic board member? And we're starting to see that change in the world. And Patty, I thank you for your question. I think it's very important that we all have a candid discussion about it. It'll be an hour-long show. Exactly. Two white dudes discussing (laughs) diversity. Welcome to... How to solve race problems (laughs) in America. From two white dudes from Brooklyn. You're welcome. (laughs) No, but it's just one of the problems is that people don't want to talk about it. I think Mm -hmm. we have to be able to have civil discourse, especially in the political space. That seems to be where it's very difficult to have a civil discourse. And I'm very proud of the Insight team and the job, Austin and Lon, 
Kim and some other folks on that team have done in being very civil and hearing out the people who disagree with them. I've watched it. About I've, politics. Right. They're very civil about it. They really hear the person out. And if, yeah, if Hillary's husband took a million dollars from Qatar or wherever, and she took a $250,000 speaking gig from Goldman, you know, that doesn't look good either. And being able to candidly discuss, hey, yes, Hillary Clinton also took speaking gigs is important. All right, let's take another question from the Cisco Spark Board. This one's from Iqbal. Go ahead, Iqbal. Hey, Jason, uh, this is Iqbal uh, from Vancouver, uh, the founder of uh, Obi. Uh, think about this way. Uh, the toys industry right now represents $87 billion yearly spent and $25 billion market only in US. What if we eliminate all this toys industry, take, get rid of all the junks and replace it with a platform for VR and ER? in which the kids they can enlarge their creativity design and power and imagination so basically the platform think about this way is going to be the netflix plus the github for uh, vr er you name it from like games uh, crafting painting everything is going to be in virtual reality and egmont reality um, which is give the kids the ability to imagine and as well as socialize one each other not only that the business is the business the business is going to be looks like the same as membership base one and we offer like basic model and little advanced and more advanced level and not only that we add on top of that a flare of little spicy of blockchain plus cryptocurrency let's say like we call it tokens so basically ob token is going to be exchanged between the kids themselves and for each token exchange they can charge and they think they can get this token be accumulating their wallets so stay tuned it's something very excited and i believe this is going to be the next big thing Okay, Iqbal, great, uh, big, far-reaching concept. What if all toys and crafts were done in virtual reality? Brian, you have virtual reality at your house. I was over there, and I saw you had the whole setup, two different VR setups with your kids. What are your thoughts on this? I'm actually appearing via VR right now. Right. So the uh, AR, no, Brian. It was. I thought it was an interesting pitch, right? Uh, you're always turned off when you hear the $87 billion market, and we're going to own the whole thing. It's $25 billion like, alone right. in the U.S. Nobody does, right? Yeah. But uh, I did love when he said, you know, and he didn't say this in so many words, but, you know, every Happy Meal toy is, like, destroying the planet. All this junk. We throw yeah. them away. Landfills full of little Happy Meal toys. Um, not a good thing, right? So getting rid of all the toys and turning it all to AR and VR, fantastic. The only problem is I read Ready Player One. I know how this ends. Like, it's a I didn't horrible finish. Don't tell dystopian us. future where, every, like, they're all plugged into VR. That's their internet. That's the whole thing. It's, um, it's not a good thing. So having just read that, it's a turn off. Hmm. But other than that, I, I like the idea of replacing really horrible physical goods that don't biodegrade, mm -hmm. that you're just churning out junk and landfill yeah. uh, for doing something that's kind of virtual. The only problem is um, not everybody can afford VR, right? So yeah. now you have a rich kid's toys. Right. And that's not, that doesn't solve it for the whole planet yet, right? Yeah. So it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Here, here's what I'll say. Let's look at something like the Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. We do not print encyclopedias anymore. Right. So as crazy as Iqbal seems in one instance, like, oh, my God, all toys will be virtual. Well, all encyclopedias are virtual now. When's the last time you physically picked up an encyclopedia? It has, it's been 30 years for me. Literally in college, I think in 1989 or 90, mm -hmm. somewhere deep in the stacks at Fordham, I touched an encyclopedia at some point to look up a plant or, a, or something. To find some stale information. To find some stale information, but it was information nonetheless. Yes. And we used to have traveling door-to-door -door salesmen, uh, sales executives who would um, you know, sell encyclopedias. And they don't exist anymore for all intents and purposes. Mm-hmm. So he's right that there will be some moments in time where something beautiful happens, like the entire world has access to Wikipedia almost right now. Even if you don't have access to the internet, you can probably get to a town somewhere that has to the a internet library. Yep. or a library. And instead of that library having to have stale information and encyclopedia that's 20 years old, 
they will have access to the same data that the modern world will have. The developing world has equal access, generally speaking, maybe not as fast, maybe not in their pocket, and everybody has access to this wonderful Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So the world can change like this. There are some dystopian negative aspects to living in a virtual world, and amongst them are you're not interacting with other people. Of course, the pro is you might interact with people online who you've never would have a chance to interact with. So at the same time that the, there is a downside, there's an upside. When we first saw the internet come out, we were, oh my God, you could socialize with everybody around the world. I could meet people in Iran. I could meet people in China. And now we do have that dynamic where people from around the world do talk to each other. And then we also conversely have people who are in Russian farms you know, making memes and videos and Facebook ads and using Facebook to f disseminate fake news and screw around with our election. Anything worth gaming will be gamed. For sure. I've heard that said. And it is absolutely going to happen. So I think there'll be some things that'll actually be even better in VR. This paint tilt brush. Yeah, it's it's intoxicating. It's intoxicating yeah. to make a 3D painting and then walk through it and, and paint the reverse side and move paint it around. Paint fire. And sparklers. And yeah, it's just, it's just crazy. It's fantastical, yeah. right? And so there'll be a whole new level of creativity. But one of the things you really want is people to also be able to manipulate stuff with their hands and be tactical. tactile. So being able to pour a cup of water or paint or mix paint, there is something in our DNA, in our brains, that make physical interactions very rewarding. So there's going to be a balance here. I do like the idea of people being able to sample stuff. And so that's also great. People might waste money trying something out and mm. not liking it. Right. So the ability to look at something in VR, you might be able to pick wiser. I don't know, maybe. But I, I don't buy that it's going to reduce waste. I don't like that part of the pitch. I think that's a feel-good part of the pitch. What I'd rather see him do, Iqbal, is to find one tilt brush-like moment. Something that's so transcendent that it shows off VR, one Wikipedia-like function that threads the needle on solving this big problem. So if there was a game like, say, chess, or something that was even more expensive than chess that most people would never have the chance to experience, like let's say people would not have the chance to experience skiing because it requires a lot of equipment, mm -hmm. or flying, flying a plane, perfect example. Most people in the world would not be able to afford to fly a plane or have access to a plane. But if we said, hey, in VR, we will put the ability to fly a plane, a jet, a fighter jet, a commercial jet, and you could literally do that flight simulator, and it was so accurate that the flight simulator was so accurate that you could actually go fly a plane, this would be amazing for society. So make Flight Simulator, which was a popular Microsoft product for a long time, make a flight simulator that actually allowed you to fly and let the world train themselves on how to fly planes. That, that's beautiful. It's like the Wikipedia to me. Flight Simulator brought flying to the masses. On a PC, Flight Simulator could be made again in VR. So find one application. A lot of times founders have this big sweeping vision of how the world will change, and they're right, but they're not focused enough to have success. Mm -hmm. So big vision, small steps is what I suggest. That's great. Okay. Nice. Well, there you have it, folks. We got through nine amazing questions. Thank you to Emmy Award winning producer Jackie for pulling all these together. And I love the fact that y'all took the time, y'all took the time to make videos for us here at This Week in Startups. That really helps. If you would like to be part of another Ask Jason episode, you can email Ask Jason at launch.co, ask Jason at launch.co, send us your video, or just ask the question on Twitter and CC at Jason and at TWI Startups. TWI Startups is our Twitter handle. Uh, Brian, uh, we'll give you a little plug for clip episodes here. Going well? It's going well. It's like week four. Com week four. Uh, consumer app. Consumer Never app. Never been happier. And people it. can download it in the App Store now and play the with it? App Store it. and Google Play. And Google Play, Clip both Android. Yeah. Uh, and what can people do with this product? Explain it in a in a thirty second pitch. Oh yeah, thirty seconds. I can do it. Like we we could do a show in thirty seconds. That's exactly. actually the point. You and I can make a video show. You can make stories with friends. Uh, you okay. can talk about any topic. Get answers from people. Nobody else but you needs the app. 
It's not live, so they can take 48 hours to respond. Go read Wikipedia. Look like a genius when they come back. Give you the best possible answer. You make a three-minute show on whatever topic, and you become the sort of thought leader in that one. So I ask a question in Clipisode, the app. It tweets out a request for answers, or I can SMS people, hey, answer this question. Mm -hmm. Then I get their clips back, and I can sort them, drag and drop them around, and export to a little show that would be like an Ask Jason, but in... 30 minutes or three minutes on my phone. And so it's really great for your musician. You have a tour dates to promote or a mm. Patreon or something. You're an author. You have a book. Mm. Uh, instead of doing content marketing, what are the, let's say you have a book on angel investing. <laughs> what are the seven things never to say to a, an investor? Or what are the three things you need in your deck? Instead, ask your fans this stuff. They answer. You put together these video shows. takes you minutes to make just a couple minutes of video. And your Twitter and your Facebook are full of you having great discussions with smart people all around the world. Who are helping you promote your stuff. Okay, that's Clip Isode, C L I P, Clip Isode. Go ahead and search for it on the App Store. And if you have questions about it, you can ask Brian Alvey on Twitter. He's Brian Alvey on Twitter. All right, we'll see you all next time. Bye bye.